Okay, one more time, let's meet on the class, uh, finance class. Hmm? I hope you're all there. And uh, we're gonna have a fun class today. I hope they're all out fun, but this is particularly fun because we're gonna talk about your favorite subject. Everybody wants to talk about it, whether you're in the petroleum business or otherwise, it affects everybody. And that subject is, you can see it right above my head, it says oil price. Uh, so that's the subject. It may take a good part of the lecture, maybe all of the lecture, I think it will. And we're going to look at different aspects about oil price behavior. Okay. But before that, I may remind you that uh, uh, after the final exam, which I believe is April the 28th, whatever date it is, we have given to you before, there shall be a class again after that. Don't miss out on that one. That'll be May the 5th. So there will be a manager finance class on May the 5th as well. Okay. So this is a reminder again. <clears throat> You're almost coming to the end of the semester. A couple, three lectures are left. And um, uh, I'll, I wish it was an ending because I enjoy what I do. And um, when the lecture and semester ends, then my enjoyment stops, if you ask me. So i uh, rather not see it end, but as much as I would not, you definitely would want to see it end and your vacation starts, okay? I, well, I wish you the best in your vacation. Having said all those pleasant things now, let us get going on the subject at hand. And the subject we shall discuss for a long while today is oil price. Uh, may I say this, <clears throat> whatever I will say now about oil price behavior is just an opinion. There's no um, formula that tells you what the price of oil can be or shall be. It's not a formula of two plus two is equal to four. It is my opinion and another person's opinion and your opinion and so on. So I can't say you're wrong or right, it's your opinion and I have to respect it. What I say, I, my opinion, I hope you will respect that. But I can say this all from the very start. My opinion, do not, I repeat, do not, you didn't hear it, I repeat again. Do not believe anybody in your life who says he can forecast the price of oil. Do not, run away from it as fast as you can. Let it go in. What a way to start this lecture. Well, everybody in this class was waiting to hear what to expect for the price of oil. And I said, do not believe anybody, no matter who he is, including myself. Don't believe me either. How many times would the professor tell you, don't believe me either? Now, why would I start a lecture like that? That is the question. We all, I have made my share of mistakes more than I can count. And I'll tell you a reason why I'm saying that. This is probably one of the most important lessons you're gonna take with you during the semester. If you can remember just this, what I'm gonna tell you now, you've done yourself a favor. And that is, if you or anybody you know, or I make a mistake, let us be confident and admit we have made a mistake. I've admitted it, have I not? Why have I admitted that on TV, on, on this computer, you, 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 you can play it again and again and show it to the whole world. Dr. Bullock said he had no idea about oil price behavior. Why do I keep saying that? Because yet I'm not a meta soul who says, hey, I'll tell you the price, get out of it. You have no clue. Now, slowly, I'm going to explain all this to you. Don't believe anything I'm telling you till I prove it to you what I'm saying. Very unusual. It's just my opinion and I could be wrong. 
I've said it at the very starting of this lecture. I was paid, it, it, my salary depended on, for maybe 30 years on forecasting the price of oil. And I'm here saying, well, I made maybe sheer mistakes. How did I, why were I told as part of a job to report cut the price of oil? Before I came to teaching, there were two other things I did in my life. Professionally, I served in electric utility business where we had to generate electricity here in Austin for eight and a half years, I think. There, I was asked to forecast the price of oil and gas and coal and U308, that is uranium yellow cake, to go into the nuclear reactor. That was my, so that based on my forecast for the next 25, 30 years, the utility would decide whether they want to put a power plant to generate electricity into the future 25 years based on which fuel, gas, oil, coal, or nuclear will be cheaper over the long term of three decades. And that is the one they're going to build. If it's nuclear, I say it's cheaper, they're going to build a nuclear plant. And they take eight to 10 years to build. So, because good part, I mean, I pick a number, 80% or so, and that's just a number, a good part of the cost of generating electricity is based on the fuel that is used to generate the steam that goes in, in terms of the turbines and all the good stuff. So that was my job. I used to forecast all of those fuels. Then one fine morning, I showed up being a banker. It was November of 81. And there, it was my same job to come up with the value of oil reserves in the ground that would serve as a security for loans that the borrower wanted from the bank. So I had to ascertain, determine what is the value of oil in the ground, security for purposes, and how can you come up with a value of anything unless you know the price? Simple, it's the price, now into the future production of oil and gas, 10, 15, 20, 30 years, depending on the uh, size of the field and the capacity to produce, multiplied by the volume. That's what it is. So the price becomes paramount and Im super important. So I did that. So I'm talking to you from my practical personal experience. And did I make mistakes? And I repeat, yes. I don't want to keep talking about my mistake, but I want you to understand that if you make your mistake, or I, please, heaven's sake, admit it. I'll tell you why now. Remember this part now. If you admit your mistake, it is not a loss. Remember, please. Admitting your mistake, mistake is not a loss to you. Why not? When you admit your mistake, you, what? You can learn from it and not make it again. So you have benefited from that mistake, not to do, make another mistake, yeah, but not the same one again. But if you don't admit you made a mistake, what will you do? You'll make it make it the same mistake again and again because you think you were right the first time and you never admitted it. That's why it's important to admit it and see what you have learned from it. If you don't admit it, you'll never learn anything from your mistake. A person who's confident, a person who's secure, admits his mistake or her mistakes. It's only an insecure person who hides behind his or her mistakes. 
That's all. Now I have to prove to you from a personal experience, an example that I experienced and the mistakes that were made by me in the oil industry it, as a whole, not one company I would exclude, every single one made the same mistake. I'll prove it to you, it'll be so clear you will not have a chance to dispute it or disagree with me, so clear if two plus two is equal to four, it's that simple, you'll see it. 1981, mark that calendar. I joined banking from the utility business and I, of course, was tasked to come up with the price of oil. I had a young lady, an assistant of mine, her name was Marjorie, Marjorie, I think Margie, one or the other very fine young woman. Sadly, she passed away fairly early. I'm very sorry about that. So I said, Margie, she was my sister. And I said, Margie, please contact Exxon Chevron, you know, BP, Shell, all these big companies and ask them if they have made a mistake and they all, if they made a, an estimate of the future price of oil, $34, 1981 uh, forward, and if they can share it with us. Sure enough, and these companies always have a forecast. They always do, you can't do anything without having a forecast. And they all say, yeah, we have forecasts <laughs> that we use for ourselves. We'd be happy to send a copy of that forecast, their own forecast, but future price of oil and gas into the future from 1981 onwards. And so I said, well, let's wait till we get it. The forecast of uh, the big companies, you know. Let me show you what I saw in those forecasts. Just, just, the, um, the, just the impression, you know, don't have to be exact. Just to get the message. Price for barrel in the year in 1981. And the gold will go this way. And I said to Margie, <coughs> open the forecast of the big company, company A. I hate to say Exxon or Chevron, I can, but I don't exactly remember which company were involved. But they were the, the top big seven sisters. So in 1981, The barrel, of, one barrel of oil was $34 a barrel. That's a fact. This company A, maybe Exxon Chevron, whichever the shell, increased the price at a you know, escalation of 9% every year and came up in the year 1997 or so. I don't remember the exact number, but it was like that. So the company A 
took the price, actual price in 1981 November and increased it at 9% or some percent, to give you an idea, and said, according to the super genius folks there, that in 1997, the price of oil should be $151 per barrel. Remember the company? B. They went up, company B went up at 8%. That the price of oil would be 147. You know, roughly, I'm just giving you general ideas. I don't have to do that. And then there will be company C. They went up at 7%. I'm just giving you them, these are not exact numbers, but somewhere in that range. These are I mean, Shell, BP, Total, or something. Chevron, Exxon, Texaco, who knows? There were big companies I remember, I can't remember 50 years ago what happened. So the range, and I would, I'm, I'm a smart guy, you know, I said, well, I put my forecast right in the middle, and I say 100 and, $49 a barrel, and mine would go up at eight and a half percent. So I went right in the middle. I had no idea. I just said, let's be safe. Let me put it in the middle. So what is the point? There's numbers not to be calculated directly, you know, exactly. In 1997, as you can see, the range was 141, as in this example, 100. Forecasting. Sitting back in 81, all these fancy com big companies, there were no computers as such. This is about, there were no computers. Let's start, hardly there was a computer, there was no computer. So the range they came up with these supernatural companies was 141 to $150 a barrel. That is what the super geniuses thought would be the price of 1997. Do you know what the actual price was? The real price was in 1997, I was there. Ten dollars a barrel. Everybody, super geniuses, think it'll be one hundred and fifty dollars in forecast. And it was $10 a barrel, $10 a barrel. Can they be proud of their forecast? I think they should tie themselves with a rock and go jump to the Gulf of Mexico for all I care. Because at least they should admit they have no idea. I was with them. I told you I was somewhere in there eight and a half. Am I saying I was right? No, but can I be proud of this performance of mine? Absolutely disgusting, if you ask me. I'm still using a strong language. I know that, I don't like to do it. But the problem is people are still doing the same thing. And what is the thing? I'm gonna talk about it. The same thing, what does the same mean? It is gonna be a different kind of a lecture. You're not gonna hear it ever again, I know that. So pay attention to this. 
ten dollars would actually happen, we were expecting to 150 or 140 dollars a barrel. Now the question is, why did we make that mistake, and what have we learned? Okay, let me read that. This is just to prove to you the futility, meaning that we have very little idea what's going to happen with the price of oil. And this is just a start. I'm going to build on this one after the other. Till you say, well, and we understand, Dr. Malik, where you're coming from. Let me erase this so we can start again with a fresh approach. What happened? Why did we not realize this mistake was uh, could happen? Why did we not realize that we were making a mistake? <laughs> I, I pointed out this example not to disappoint you, not to discourage you, but only to make you being realistic that when you see these big towers downtown, 50 stories, and this company's headquarters oil, this oil company, you say, well, those guys in this top floor, the big chairman, they must know better. Let's go talk to them about oil price. I've told you how much they know. Did I say I know any better? No. There's something I've learned now. Where did we go wrong? And how did everybody go wrong? Simple. Confidence is good. Listen to this today's lecture. Overconfidence can kill you, me. Give you an example. I, I'm here to give you confidence with knowledge, but overconfidence can be a killer. Give you an example. Examples are so simple that even a fifth grade kid can understand because that's the, I take pride in, the, in that. Life is not that so difficult. Keep your feet to the ground, please. Example. Person buys a car and he knows, he thinks he's a very good driver. He can stop the car right away when he wants to. He's so confident, he's like, I can stop the car immediately when if I have to, I can put the brake and stop. Very confident. No, one more time. He's overconfident. He thinks he can stop whenever he wants to. And guess what? He's going along on the highway at 150, 150 miles an hour. And the next car in front of him is 100 yards in front. And he's so confident, he's overconfident. He can stop. So what if he's going 150? And when he applies the brake behind the guy going at 150, his car does not stop in a, and at, at that speed. So what happened? He goes in, hits the car in the front. I hope nobody died because he was overconfident that he could stop the car. And when the time came, he had to stop the car. He applied the brake. That car was not capable of doing that at that time, nor was he capable of performing that function either. Confidence is very good. Please have it. Overconfident is like that driver who killed himself, maybe. Overreached it. Now, what does that mean in terms of oil price? 
if you ever take a basic course in economics, the first lecture of economics is, first lecture is what? Three things, supply, demand, govern, price, that's all. Last 500 million years, this is the thing that has never failed, never. Supply, demand, govern, price. Supply goes up, demand goes down, price goes down. Supply goes up, demand goes down, price goes down. Supply goes down, demand goes up, price goes up. It's so basic, it's the third grade. Stick to the ground, keep your feet on the ground. When you like the confident driver overcome, you forget what? The basics of, we call it uh, one, um, economics 101, meaning the first lesson of economics because we are too confident to follow basic things because now we've got computers to worry about. They can tell us what the price is, nonsense. No computer has any capacity, never will and never does have, but for the price, for, I'll prove it to you. These are very strange things you're hearing and I'm gonna prove every single one of them because this is a very unusual lecture. And no wonder you say, well, why do people keep calling? In fact, a, a delegation is on its way from an African country, the whole, to listen to me. I said, no, I told you before, you know, I'm not going. I've been there, I've seen it, I, said, I don't wanna go back. You know, I'm, I'm not comfortable, it's virus business. They're coming to listen to these things. Not to get to say, well, where is the computer business? Now, back to basics of economics. When we drew up this 9% increase, 8% increase in the price, remember the price was going 8 and 9? We didn't realize that when the price would go like 150, go up, what would happen? The demand will go down, nobody can afford it, the oil. And therefore, what the price will go down. We thought we're too smart. We can just go nine to ten percent, and then forever the price will. That's when we get too confident. Something as simple as that, we never realized. We never realized that at some point the consumer, you and I, are going to react and say, "No, stop it. We can't put too much gasoline in the car. It is too expensive. The demand goes down." That's the first thing in economics, man. The first thing, and if we forgot it because now we are too confident, we've got a computer to work with. Good. So let me tell you what we learned. At least what I have learned. I don't know about the rest. Number one, which, we, which uh, people didn't realize earlier, nor did I, but now I have learned it. Others, I don't know, it doesn't matter. What would happen? If the price of, of any commodity goes up, anything, what do you do? You uh, conserve it, you save it because it's expensive, conservation happens. Therefore, the demand for oil went down. When the price of oil went from $3, it did from $3 to $34 a barrel in a few years, it did go from three to thirty-four dollars. I'm going to go talk about that in a minute. I've got a graph to show you. There's some handouts. It went up a thousand percent. You and I stopped driving as, as much. There was conservation, and therefore, what happened? The demand for oil went down because of conservation. I'm going to write it in a minute. Number two, but the demand, no. when the price of oil went up, the price of gas went up, the price of, you know, the, oil is expensive, so people say, well, let's not use oil to generate electricity. Let's use substitutes, find another way to electricity, maybe renewable, maybe wind energy, maybe nuclear energy. 
So there's a substitution. When this commodity goes up in price, people find other ways, cheaper ways to substitute and fulfill the demand to energy. So as I said, I understand nuclear power. What happened? 1981, when the, we saw the price was going up, we started building the, the nuclear power project that we have talked about before. We didn't think of it in the 60s. There was no need for it. The oil, gas were cheap. When they started going up from three to $34, that's a fact, both are facts. Now we're talking nuclear, so, and we did, and that's a fact, 1980. So what would happen? The demand for oil would go down for our generation because nuclear is going to take over some of the, and the demand, cater to some of the electric generation. Let's see what, that's the second thing. Third thing. It's not only oil, it's for everything. This thing applies to everything in life. Efficiency. What does that mean? Oil went up in price. We stopped wasting it. We started using it more efficiently. Instead of going to the HEV store five times, pick up five different items. Five trips to five. Now we went, started going to pick up five items in one trip. There were more efficiency. Common sense. I would be doing the same thing and I did it. Well, boy, man, I'm trying to pick the Coca Cola and the bananas or whatever the chilies that I want all in one trip. Why do I have to go there five times? Therefore, the demand went down. Okay. Look at the impact of all of these little things on demand. Let, let me write down some of these so that before I forget, we talk about conservation, we talk about substitution, we talk about efficiency. There are a couple more to go. These are the things now we realize, we forgot about all of this. The top three have already discussed. 
is a lot, again, is a primary school and we should not have. But when we got too confident, we could so small, we forgot economics, basic economics. This is basic economics lecture. Overconfident, we forget all of this. Overconfident. So, number four. I've written it, you can write it, and I'm going to explain number four. Again, price of oil. $3 shot up, shot up to $34 a barrel. That's a fact. 1,000% or more increase. Tell me, the price of oil went like this, like a rocket. Is now oil a very good business to be in? You better believe it. So everybody and his friend at, 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 at the $34 a barrel price, compared to three dollars, started looking for oil. Non-OPEC countries also. Non-OPEC countries said, look okay, here, why should we buy oil from somewhere else? We can find our own oil because the price is too high. So their production of non-OPEC went up and guess whose production logically had to go down. There's just so much demand in the world. So OPEC had to reduce its production because non-OPEC was producing more, more non-OPEC countries. Therefore, the, you can see the arrow here, the, the OPEC production went down, number four. Let's take another one. Recession. Well, if you ask an economist what in the world is a recession, he will say so many things so complicated that you wish you never asked him. It just makes life complicated. I will make it easy and simple. Simple. Forget the technical definition of recession. To me, a recession in the economy is when the industrial output from the factories, you know, factories produce, plants produce. When the industrial output products get slows down, less products are in demand. Therefore, what the economy slows down, and therefore, what factories and plants are not working as much, and therefore, what there is a reduction in oil demand. So recession is slowing down, slowing down of the industrial activity in the nation. As a result, demand for oil went down. And I could go on and on. Just if you limit it to these five factors alone, one to five, cumulatively together, cumulatively together, we add up all of these little bits, add up together, the demand for oil went down. See that? The demand for oil took a nose down. And it did. I showed you. I've got figures. To, I'm not making it up. It's actually what happened. I've got the data to show you that. So then what did OPEC do? They had surplus of 13 million barrels because nobody wanted to buy their oil. So when the demand went down, the price had to come down. All these five factors then got OPEC to reduce the price of oil there. In OPEC deal in 1980, if you can read this, it's 1983. If you can't read it, because the color of here, I'll read it. So in 1983, OPEC 
drop the price of oil officially. All this, the attachments that will be coming to you. These attachments all has it in attachments. Okay, they're coming. So that means all these factors led to the price to slow down from increasing. So I would call it the ceiling price of oil. Ceiling top. So the price fall cannot continue to go on forever, cannot continue to go on forever. It has to stop at some point. And that is what I call this. It can't go on forever. It has to stop as is here. So that's what I said. At one point, there will be a ceiling, the top in the price of oil. That is what we've learned now. <laughs> ceiling price, they stop. After that, the demand goes down and then the price goes down. Now, let me take this and start again with another concept. So there is a top price. If it goes way above the top, the demand will go down and then the price will go down. Simple logic. I don't know, I may have said something in the first lecture on different cha changes in the oil business. But I'll go ahead and repeat one, one information there now. More and more oil is now being produced in offshore areas. Offshore Gulf of Mexico, offshore Brazil, offshore West Africa and countries like uh, Nigeria and others. So much so that uh, <clears throat> out of the roughly 100 million barrels of oil that are produced every day, roughly 40 to 50% of the world's oil is produced in the offshore areas. That's a fact, not an opinion. I separate facts from opinion. On opinions, we can differ, but in fact, we cannot. So 40 million barrels, 40% is 40 million barrel, is of 50 million, or it's 50%. If it is, even if it is the low 40 million barrel per day figure that we want to use, that's a lot of oil every day in the market. 40 million barrels of oil is a tremendous of amount of oil. Tell me, is offshore oil exploration and production costly or cheap? It's what? Very expensive. The deeper you go, the more expensive. The farther you go into the ocean and see, the more expensive. For 100 reasons that are so basic and understandable, so I don't even have to cover those. Anybody should know that. So what happens? Talking about the future. 40 million barrels, let's say, are coming from offshore. And guess what? If the price fall begins to drop, and drop and drop, what would happen to offshore production? It will begin to drop, obviously. It will become uneconomic to produce. So when the offshore production goes slowly out of the picture in the, in the economy, that's oil in the world economy is now, less offshore oil now available, 
and with less supply of oil in the world overall, what happened to the price of oil? It begins to go up again. So I would say offshore product, cost of cost of offshore production or of oil will set a floor in the price of oil, bottom. Floor. And there are other factors I can keep on talking, but what are they that will set the floor? So we've talked about the ceiling set by those five factors we discussed earlier. Now we talk about the, where is the bottom? Can it continue to go down the price? No. As an example, offshore dis disappear and then or diminish and then price will rise up and that's establishing the concept of flow. Let me illustrate this. Price of oil goes down, offshore production will go down also. So up to a point when the offshore production goes down and down and down, there will be less supply of oil in the world, then the offshore production will begin to increase again. Till I mean, it drop, then the price goes up, offshore production will begin to go up. So this so in summary, in summation, all I can say is With the price of oil into the future, 10, 15, 20, 30 years, it'll go, it will move between a ceiling and the floor, and you will see like this. This is the, it's not going to be like this or like this, it's going to be the curve I'm showing you based on the factors I've discussed with you. Okay. So two things that I've taught you so far on oil price behavior is number one, in my judgment, God knows, there will be a top price, it cannot go on forever. There would be bottom price, it cannot go down forever. Somewhere between top and bottom, we will wave, look at this wavy line. The other factors that are very costly to produce will add to the floor price stopping. The price of the production will stop and cause the floor price. For example, EOR and enhanced oil recovery. Expensive. Same principle will apply there. If price goes down, your EOR projects will become, a, uh, become an, uh, not uh, economic, and so on. So offshore is not one. I can name a few others that have become uneconomic when the price goes down. So beside the concept of floor and ceiling. There are other things that I'm going to teach you guys and girls. Let's talk about that. Okay. Let me draw. Okay. Uh, the graph. Uh, 
uh, I'm going to ask you, this graph is going to show you something. And I didn't have this originally in my plan to show you, but I just picked it up and I'm going to show, add that to your attachment. So this should come as an attachment to you, okay? So whatever I'm going to draw here is reflected in this graph. Remember that, please. And we'll do to some number attachment, something here, we'll write it down. Some facts now, no guessing here, no forecast facts. First fact is this, shock your surprise. For, when was the oil price produced first time in America? Any idea? Normally let the student guess it, but then I tell them here, I like to save time, just tell you. 1859, 18, 18, 1859, the first oil well was drilled. From 1859, listen carefully. You won't believe what you're going to hear. The price of oil, or roughly, till 1973, 100 years, was a constant. Was it? Constant, 100 years. Now every day there's a different price, even every two hours there's a different price. For 100 years, it was the same price, and that was $3 a barrel. You'll see that in the graph I'm going to show you, or that you'll see. That was copied from BP, British, BP, the oil company. And that should go as an attachment one, I think, yeah. Then, in 1973,
from 1970 to 1983, the pro that's 10 years. This is 100 years, this is 10 years. The price of oil kept going up and up all the way to 30, $34 a barrel. So it kept going for 10 years, it started going up to 1983. And, and look at the arrow. From 73 to 83, and look at, in 83, the price of oil dropped. Later we'll discuss why did it drop. And dropped to what? $29 a barrel by $5. Okay. So the price went up like this. In 1990, 91. The price of all shot up. To 40, suddenly look how fast it went up. And it came down like this in one year. This is probably now. So what have you seen here? The oil price went 100 years, this, then it became 10 years, and then it became one year. Is what? 100 year cycle of change, 100 year cycle was reduced to oil price change cycle to 10 years. And in 1990, 91, it was reduced to one year. Okay, look, right away. And now it's jumping every day. Maybe every two weeks, every month, every two months, you know, the Ukraine business. So this thing you now jumping up and down, like quickly changing, and you seeing it. English word is volatile. The price of volatile meaning up and down, up and down quickly. The change of 100 years before it changed to 10 years reduced to now. One year now, every two weeks. So the third thing we are learning now is the price of oil volatility in the price of oil.
let us mark this as attachment one. See? So you'll see this what I'm showing you as an check the proof attachment one. I hope that we can put it straight so you can, well, anyway, you got the message. Let us see what is the fourth thing we're gonna talk about today. If I ask you, when we talk about the price of oil, which oil are we talking about? The oil could be dependent on the API gravity, the, it could be in the sulfur content, and um, so many factors. You know, from one field to another field in the same country, it can be different. From one area in one in certain areas in the world, it could be a different price versus another area. No. So all these factors lead to very surprising, but when we say, in, when we used to say that the OPEC has set the price of oil at $34 a barrel, the price of oil never exceeded $34 a barrel officially. Which oil were we talking about? Which country, which quality? That was the reference crude oil was Saudi Arabian light. So whenever we talked about crude oil at $34 a barrel in 1981, it was in of Saudi Arabian light crude of certain API and sulfur content. So, you know, from that, the others, you know, if there's poor quality, then Saudi it will be priced less and all, but that the reference crude was Saudi light. All this changed in 1984, no, oh, take it, in 1986. In 1986, what happened? OPEC had a meeting in Ecuador, Ecuador is a country in Latin America, 1986, November to be exact. And in that meeting, OPEC members decided that they will not use Saudi Arabian crude oil as the reference crude oil. And they said, now we will use what we call a basket of crude oils, a collection of crude oils, and they'll take the average price and that will become the official OPEC price. In this basket of crude oil, they included seven crude oils. So that Saudi Arabia being one and the only crude till 1986 as a reference crude, that changed, that's two basket of seven crudes, okay? So that's the fourth thing we have learned is the concept of the basket of crude. Let's try to... I ask you to look at attachment two.
It says major oil price changes. What does it mean? In order to discuss a, F, a subject, if you're the specialist in this, there have to be some basic facts that you have to know. For example, if you're a reservoir engineer, you have to know the concept of PVT, pressure, volume, temperature. For example, if you're an economist, you have to know the fundamentals of inflation. If you're a geologist, you should know what is this um, a stratigraphic track, trap versus a, um, a structural trap where you collect oil, accumulates. These are something basic, synclines and anticlines, the geological terminology. So these are some of the fundamental thought, knowledge, basic knowledge, that if you're in that field, you should know before you can claim you know anything about that field. So here are on page, attachment two, some basic information that you should have here all the time if you're going to be in the business of understanding oil price behavior. And you'll see in attachment two, an important date, you can read with me, 1973. That's when the price of oil jumped first time ever after 100 years from $3 to $12. You can read it. From $3 to $12 in 1973, it says Arab-Israeli conflict led to quadrupling of the oil price from three to twelve dollars. It was the Arab-Israeli conflict, the war, Yom Kippur War. You can skip October eighty-one; it's important. But let's go to March eighty-three, which is very important. I just explained to you in eighty-three what happened. For the first time, OPEC announces lowering, reducing the price of crude oil by $5 from $34 to $29 a barrel. I just told you about it. That's an important date because the first time they reduced, 73 was important because the first time they increased. September of 85 is the next important date. Read it. Then I shall read it. September 55, 1985. Saudi Arabia agrees to sell crude based on net back pricing. net back pricing was introduced in the market by Saudi Arabia for selling and buying crude oil. Nobody, I don't know if anybody has ever referred to this 85 as an important date. I like to believe how different is my thinking. A major revolution took place in the oil industry in 1985, and that was a result of what? of Saudi Arabia's actions. Nobody even thinks of it. I said, oh boy, don't forget it. It's a huge event. Shows you my thinking is different, right or right or wrong is different. So I'll explain to you why I call it a revolution in that 85, don't forget it. And they introduced what is called net back pricing. At that time when I explain this, I ex tell you what is net back pricing, easy. November of 86, the last day, remember I said in Ecuador, they had a meeting, okay. They introduced a basket of seven crudes and the names are given is Saudi Light, Indonesia, Dubai, Nigerian, Algerian, Venezuelan, and Mexican. Here are the names, seven, okay. Now, this is the third thing you've learned. Oh no, how many? Have we written the basket of cruise number four? 
number five, the last one, I'll pause because this is something extremely important for me to explain to you why is it important. Remember that, please. It's, it's very important. I want you to be very fresh to understand why, what is number five going to reveal and what, what I say and why I say it is so important, extremely important. That will help you understand why I say forecasting oil prices very difficult, if not impossible. There lie, will lie the answer to this mystery of why I have been saying it is difficult, if not impossible, to forecast. Okay, so with number five, that will be revealed when you meet when. Why, what the heck, how many? 12 minutes now. Be fresh. Don't miss out the first part. You're better off coming after 11 minutes or waiting for a minute rather than catch up. I come at 12 minutes and try to catch up. You'll be lost and confused, okay? 11 minutes plus one is 12. I'll be here in 12 minutes. I'm looking at my watch right, right here, okay? Then we'll reveal the, the fun thing. This will be really eye-opener for you.
Well, I hope you're all back there. Okay. Let's see, the time is where? Right on time. So let's see what is uh, the uh, fifth thing we're going to learn, which I <coughs> said was extremely important from my perspective, and I hope when I explain it to you, you feel why I said it was important, okay? Let me, and, and I said five things we are learning, okay? Um, as I said, from our mistakes, uh, we, we can learn. And this is one thing definitely I've learned that I'm gonna talk about now. Well, let me draw something on the board and then we'll talk about it, okay? It's gonna be a little bit repeat of the previous graph, uh, not all of it, some of it. So please do not be confused. Take down the graph now again, even if you think you've seen it before, it will change after a little while. So uh, you can start now with me. Price is always dollars per barrel, okay? In fact, today's news, for the first time I've read today's news before coming here, you know that Russia is saying now, if you want to buy our crude, you'll have to pay Pay, uh, buy it in ruble, you'll have to pay us, you know, you buy it in ruble, their currency is called ruble. And uh, today it said, Poland said, okay, we will buy your crude oil in rubles, not dollars. Okay, so I thought, of, I just thought of that. So today's news. The year is 1859, and I said, it's going to be a bit of a repeat. Till 1973, the price of oil was three dollars a barrel. Then, in, in 1973, after it shot up from three dollars, it shot up to this side, to no. I want to make it more prominent so you can see the, the effect in a different color so you can see the effect. In 1973, the price was shot up. From $3 to $12 a barrel because of the Arab-Israeli conflict. There was a, you might have read it in the books of history. There was a war between the Arabs and the Israelis called the Yom Kippur War, very famous war. As a result of that war, the price of oil, there are a lot of 
history behind it. And not, this might not be necessary to be a long lecture then. The price of oil jumped from $3 to $12, four times in a matter of a week almost. And then you would agree with me that war is a geopolitical event, geopolitics. I hope you agree. Now the price of oil then kept going up because twelve dollars a barrel till the year nineteen. 79. I'm going to use this new year now. You take note of it. It was not a new job. In 1979, the price of oil went to from $12 a barrel to $24 a barrel. 1979. You wonder what happened. Normally, these are the things that I exchange in the class, go back and forth. What do you think happened? And I explain what happened. Again, you know, I just have to tell you what happened. You, just, you kind of condense the lecture, put more into it in short time that way. What happened in 1979, you ask me, there was the Iranian revolution where the Shah of Iran abdicated the throne, left Iran, and Imam Khomeini, the religious leader, came over. It was a major revolution that is still continuing in the sense that all the embargo in Iran started back in 1979, okay? So again, you will admit that a revolution is as big as that is also to be considered a geopolitical event or geopolitics, no denying that. So you're seeing that a Connection, every time you see there's a price increase, there's a connection with geopolitics. So then what happened is the price of oil. Remember, in 1973 it came down, 83 came down, and then it shot up. This is the old graph, you see, you got it already. In 90, 1991. This was Gulf War number one under George Bush Sr. The price shot up and came down. It was Kuwait, Iraq situation, and we sent a force to liberate Kuwait. And then again, you would say to and agree with me, it is a war between Iraq, America, and Kuwait is a geopolitical event. Price went up to forty dollars a barrel. Shot up, and then came down. If you want, right on. I know. I might as well use the same color scheme, otherwise it will get confusing. Oh Lord, mercy, my curves. This up and down again is it? The geopolitical event. That's right on geopolitical. The Kuwaiti war and Iraqi war. Again, I hope you're getting the message that whenever these big changes are happening in the price of oil from 3 to 12 to 12 to 24 are all accompanied by geopolitical events. And finally, recently, as you have seen recently in the last few months, while I'm going up and playing around, is this, what is this now recently? We have the Ukrainian situation, the Russian invasion, Russia, the war, Russia, Russia Two thousand and 
to right now, 2022. Right now, it's happening. Price went up to $140 and came down to $100 and is moving around like that. This Russian war again will be considered as is ongoing. Geopolitical event. There could be several others I could expand, but four are enough. Roughly, generally speaking, what have you seen is this whenever, look at the four examples, there have been major changes in the price of oil. The always underlying factor has invariably been geopolitics. No doubt about it. None whatsoever. Zero debate on that. Geopolitics, 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 geopolitics. There is definitely then a connection with geopolitics and oil price behavior. The fifth thing we're learning today is the last one, and I'm going to talk about it for 20 30 minutes, just the geopolitics part of it. Fifth thing is geopolitical connection. More five things are enough to give them one lecture. So the fifth thing you're learning now is the connection between geopolitics. You can see I'll let you see geopolitics you've heard it. the connection with geopolitics and oil price behavior. No denying it. You cannot, nobody can unless somebody is just not listening. So therefore. Let's see what we can do. Why is that important? We must entire. Um, tell me, please, how does a computer work? I have absolutely zero on computers. Zero, none. I'm the, I do not know the ABC of computers. There's no secret about. I know more things than most anybody would ever learn. But I, this is one thing. I, I'm, I'm zero. I don't have to know everything about everything. I can't perform medical surgery, but I can do this. They can't talk about this, but I, I can do. This. You see, so there's no harm saying I'm sorry. I don't know them. So big deal. Always, I when I don't, so I just make it. I say I don't know because I already know. And love, why do I have to know everything? It's not possible, no human being can do that. So why do I say that I don't know anything but I do not. But I can tell you what I think how computer works. Computer is a is this box here instead of sitting in front of you. And a computer programmer, listen carefully now, very, very, very carefully. They call them some computer programmers. They they devise a formula. No, and they put it in the computer. They come, to, they have a form that there, that's the job. And some person like me, I don't know how to make the formula in the computer in the back of the screen. It's all in the computer in the back. When I all only do is I, I press the button on the, the key here and the chips, they call them chips in the back somewhere. They start jumping like this. The chips are jumping. And after about a half a second, they stop jumping and they give me the answer. That's it. That's how I look at computers. Some smart guy, not me, who put the equation, you know, then we come up with the equation program, put it in the computer. And all I know is repress the button and the, the chips and all the computer programming and the formula start jumping and after uh, half a second or two seconds, they flash the answer. I hope I got it right there. Tell me please, is there any computer program that any human being can devise, listen carefully, that can tell us or could tell us 
how Saddam Hussein used to think is that no matter how complex is the equation that can be funded, the computer problem, how Biden, not Biden, the other guy, Putin, Russia thinks, yet what Saddam does and what Russian President Putin does changes completely has the biggest impact on oil price changes and behavior. But listen carefully, logic. There is no computer yet created that can tell us how and when these geologic, geopolitical events will take place. I had no idea when the Yom Kippur war would happen. There's no computer that tells me that. No computer could tell me when the Khomeini, the Imam from Iran will show up on the plane, Air France, by the way. There's no computer that tells me how Saddam used to think and when he's going to invade Kuwait and simulate with Russia. So why in the world, I fail to understand, I'm getting a little forceful, why in the world that we are relying on computer to tell us when the oil price will change, or what the future will be the oil price of oil price? When we know after my lecture that no computer can tell us when the geopolitical event will happen, and yet geopolitical event will govern the oil price side, therefore there is no computer can tell us when the oil price changes will happen because they're too connected, geopolitics and oil price behavior. And we can't forecast geopolitical events, therefore we cannot forecast the price of oil using a computer. Simple as that. And we are trying and we are trying and trying to find an answer through some econometric nonsense, if you ask me, and failing every time. I'm using strong language. I know that because I feel strongly about it. It affects us, our lives, and these people make mistakes through the computer. We are making or asking the computer to do something that it is not capable of doing. Simple as that. When the computer got created 40, 50 years back, like the child who gets a Christmas present and gets a little, you know, children get a little airplane thing this big, and they, they or they, they have a car, we call, I call it dinky car, like, you know, two inches, three inches little car, you know, and the kid runs the car like this and the car moves, you know, and the kids get it at Christmas, you know, it's five, four-year-old kid. And suddenly the kids, you know, starts again and again and after some time, he gets bored with the car and he tries to make it fly. Hey, little kids do that all the time. I have current cringe. I say, will the car fly? No, it's not meant to fly. Same way our so-called super genius econometricians found this little toy computer and they try to make it do something it is not capable of doing, like the car is not capable of flying. That's my explanation. Maybe it's wrong, but I'm quite pleased with it. I'm not saying I'm right. Did I say that? At the very outset of my lecture, I said, these are opinions. And I have a habit of making my, my opinion known. Not here, all over the globe. All over the globe, I've said these things are words I'd say over the, to congressmen, senators, ministers, golly, general, even general was attending my lecture. And ambassadors. Nobody said, no, sir, you're not making sense. At least they were courteous not to say that at my face. Anyway, enough of that. Let's now move on. So I've told you five things that we've learned today. Different lecture, I prepared you for it, okay? I left it at the end. There is no chapter in the, in the reference book that I can give you on this. How can there be one? I have to write my own book. When will I get the time to do that? Then you'll be able to read it, okay? Let's move on. Let me erase this and then start again with a totally different concept and take you back to 1986. No, the Saudis introduced net, net back pricing. Now we're slowly going into net back pricing. These are called new oil pricing mechanism, methods to price oil, the new ones. Net back pricing is one of them, okay? <laughs> Thank you. 
If you go to attachment number two, major oil price changes, the year 85, I said Saudi Arabia agrees to sell crude oil on the basis of net back pricing. So now slowly I'm going to explain to you but OPEC quotas and Saudi Arabia, why they introduced net back pricing and also what is it? So yeah, I'm going to take you back in time to 85 when the net back was introduced. This comes under the heading of how oil is traded, bought and sold in the world market. So I'm taking you into oil trading, buying and selling oil globally and how it is priced globally and uh, the different new methods, how you price oil, net back pricing being only one of them. Let us start with number three attachment. It says crude, OPEC's crude oil production and always help to help you focus. I always put arrows where I'm going to talk on the subject. In 1979, if you look at attachment three, this is the production of OPEC in 1979, 33, 0.9 million barrels a day. And if you see that in 80, 81, 82, and into 83, it kept dropping and dropping and dropping. You see that? And it, and it dropped to 17.5 million barrels in 1983. From 79 to 83, that was meaning 13, 1, 3, 13.4 million barrels OPEC had the capacity to produce that, but they could not sell it. There was no demand for it. The price of oil went up. Remember, like from three to thirty-four dollars in nineteen eighty-three, nineteen eighty-one. In fact, why would anybody buy oil then? Therefore, there was no demand. There's Thirteen million barrels surplus of oil floating in the world. Nobody wanted it. So, what can you do? If you have something that nobody wants, what can you do, your seller? Again, I wish you were sitting in front of me in the class and we could have a very interesting discussion. Short of that, I just have to tell you what you can do. One is, in the common sense, no super genius here, any product, oil being a product, if it's not selling, what do you do? You reduce the price of oil. That's all. You reduce the price of the product, hoping somebody will buy it. <clears throat> so the demand would go up. The price will stabilize. So exactly that's what OPEC did. Take note of it. March 1. 1983 is a very important date. For the first time, OPEC reduced the price of oil by $5 to increase the demand. It went down from $34 to $29 a barrel. I think I wrote it in an earlier graph on the board. <coughs> Hoping the demand will pick up. 
what else can OPEC do other than you know make it incentive to use more oil? It can cut down the supply. <coughs> and they did that. Symbol. They introduced quotas of for production. Quotas mean in same day, same time, March 183, to see reduce price, reduce quota. Meaning every member of OPEC at that time, there are 13 members of OPEC was obliged, had to reduce its production. They said, everybody reduce your production and every country was given a certain amount of limit called quotas, is the, how much they were allowed to produce. Okay, so the two things, if I ask you in the exam, when were, what were the two decisions taken by OPEC in 83? These are the two, reduce price, introduce quotas. Now we have to focus on the biggest producer of Saudi of OPEC, Saudi Arabia, and the introduction of net back pricing by Saudi Arabia. Now is that is a question? Not difficult to understand at all. For that, when net back, we have to go up to when net back pricing was introduced. We don't have to talk about it today. We could talk about the nineteen eighty. 85, I believe, when it was introduced. Let's go back in history. Mentally, we should be there in 85 and see what's going on in the minds of the Saudi government at that time. For that, I ask you to turn to attachment four. Give me a minute to look at it. Focus on the, on the dates with the arrows. Give you a couple of minutes to look at it, and we will talk about it. Focus on the arrows. Let me read it to you. Attachment four. Saudi Arabia crude oil production. Okay, thousand barrels per day. Let's go straight to 1980 in the arrow. Saudi Arabia at that time was producing 9.6 million barrels per day. Let's round it off to 10 million barrels a day. Remember, keep that in your mind. 1980, 10 million barrels a day. As you can see yourself, after that, the price of the production of Saudi Arabia started going down to 1981, went down, 82, it went down. You can see 83, it went down, 84, it went down to 4 million. In 85, it went down to 3.6 million. Let's look at it, first quarter. The second quarter, it went down to 2.7 million barrels a day from 10 million folks going down, down, down to 2.7 million barrels a day. Third quarter, wow, going down for 2.5 million barrels a day, one fourth from the peak. and then watch it. Fourth quarter, jumped, it, it doubled, bang, 
to five, four point five million batteries. It's four point five. From two to four, double. It's coming down and suddenly take up. Something must have happened. Rest the revolution we're going to talk about. It's just like you're coming down to land at the airport here. From 10,000 feet, you can go through seven, eight, and seven, six, four, five, three, two. Just as you're going to touch the runway, the plane takes off again. Are you going to be very happy? I'm not going to be happy. I'm going to be scared to death. That's what happened, man. Why did he come and go back up again? There must be some serious problem. So he saw that he had a serious problem. The production from 10 million barrels back in 1915 from 9.6 went down to 2.5. So the, from the peak, Saudi production one fourth. Let it sink in if you're a Saudi fellow. At the same time, simultaneously, while the production was going to remember, I said, OPEC quota and all that stuff, you know, reducing price. The price of oil has gone down to one third from the peak. Meaning what? That means what? The Saudi revenues had dropped to one twelve, ten percent, even less, to ten percent of the peak, ten percent revenues, money. They're going to be happy. If you're working, you your salary goes to one tenth. Are you going to be happy? If you're married, your wife says, "Get out of here, go find another job." I can't run this house with 10% income. Go work at night also. Don't come home till you get half a decent salary. It's a bad situation for anybody. I, are the Saudis going to let it go? No, they said, no, we are going to take things in our own hands. Everybody is producing more than their quota. You know, remember quotas were established, you produce this one, you produce this one, you produce, and everybody was cheating, they're producing more than the quota. So everybody was in the OPEC countries were producing more than they were supposed to. So Saudi Arabia, they had a special role called swing produce, had to cut their production. For others cheating, nobody was listening to Saudi Arabia. So that's what was happening, cutting, cutting, cutting by Saudi Arabia to one fourth of the peak. No, sir, Saudis aren't going to take it. They did not. And they said, we will do the following, their action. They said, come and take the oil free. Take the oil from um, Saudi Arabia, take it to Houston. Don't pay us anything. Take it. Everybody's going to come and take oil. I would say, here is my bucket, please fill up with oil. And this, uh, now listen very carefully, this is the end. I'm talking about net back here, pricing, very serious matter. So the Saudis said, take the barrel of oil, 100 billion barrel, 10 million, take it to Saudi Arabia, don't pay us anything, no price has been established. Sell it as gasoline, you're going to refine it to the market in Houston, San Antonio, Austin as gasoline. Let the consumer pay whatever price they want to pay in Austin. After you what? You refine the crude oil. One barrel of oil, you collected some revenue from the sale of ga gasoline, barrel oil into gasoline, sold for so much money. From that revenue coming from a barrel of gasoline now product, take out your cost company, 
first. So the company is very happy. Oh, we got our cost back. They got the transportation from Saudi Arabia to Houston. Oh, we're very happy. Our transportation is covered. They got all your operating costs of the refinery and everything else. Oh, thank you, Mr. Saudi Arabia. Well, you're wonderful people. We're very happy that there's no risk. We've recovered everything we could. Everything, take out whatever you spend. Give me back, the Saudi government said. Give the Saudi government back from the sale of the product gasoline after taking all the costs, what is left. Net back to the Saudi government, subtract everything, all the costs, net back, give back to the Saudi government. After taking out all the costs from the revenue that you got from selling the product called gasoline here. That is called net back, give us back. So now the question is why call it a revolution according to my theory? I hope you follow, it's so straightforward. I call it a revolution for this. Before net back pricing, listen carefully, please. When I, I ask the students this normally, you know, and then they shout, and I say, no, shout louder. And I, I'm sorry, this, that's a very dramatic kind of a lecture I give here. And before, before a net back pricing was introduced by Saudi Arabia, who set the price of oil, crude oil? The producer. The producer of oil, Saudi Arabia, they set the price of oil and say, well, Exxon, you want to have oil? You have to pay this much a barrel, $4 a barrel. This time they said, no, you take it. No price is established. So after net back pricing was introduced, after, who set the price of oil? Not the producer, because that's, they said, take it. The consumer in Austin and San Antonio or Bangkok or, or Australia, the consumer set the price of oil. So whatever they said, they, whatever they paid the consumer, what was left, from the revenue, they saw they got what was left. They do back what was. If this is not a revolution, what would you call it a revolution? The force behind oil pricing setting mechanism moved because of net back pricing from the producer to the consumer in Australia. How else can you define a revolution? So at that time was at the. I wouldn't say mercy, I had to take whatever they could get from the sale of the product from the fellow sitting over in Austin, San Antonio. So the power now came into the, and it is still there now. Well, the, 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 forget the Ukraine business, it's about a month old. I don't know what happened. Nobody knows what's going on there. That's called net back pricing. I hope you've understood it. Not very difficult concept. The second one I'm going to talk about as a new mechanism is important. Why? Because most of the oil today is sold under, this is trading, futures contracts. Net back pricing was, is old, nobody does that now. But futures market is happening now, almost all, 80%, 90% of the world's crude oil is sold under futures contracts. Let me explain to you what is a futures contract. It's not only oil, it's called wheat and barley and corn and rice, everything. These are called com commodities. There's a mercantile exchange in New York where you can have a crude, crude oil futures. You don't buy and sell through dollars you buy. You know, you say, I give me a thousand tons of this and a thousand tons of that, the crude oil. Let me make it so simple and not spend too much time here and there. A futures company is, is trading of oil in the stock market. Uh, it is traded in the, um, I'll just write in a couple of things.
you can have a futures contract in my on the stock exchange called NYMEX. New York Mercantile, I've written the word mercantile on the word exchange, commodities, mercantile. A futures contract is between two traders, two traders, two, do it. It is between a buyer of oil and a seller of oil, or a buyer of one product versus a seller of oil. A simple switches contract is made up of three parts. Number one, the buyer says to the seller, I want a million barrels of oil. To establish it, you need the buyer. And the sellers say, oh, okay, obviously, when do you want it? And they agree on a price. The buyer says, I'll pay you $80 a barrel. That's it. That's a futures contract. The buyer says, I need a million barrels and I want it after maybe 30 days, not now, I'll pay you $80. If both sign, buy and sell, there is a, that's a future, it's a commitment on both sides. That's a contract, it's an agreement. If you want to know what's a contract, take me other course on Friday tomorrow. And that's a whole course on contracts. But exploration production contracts, nothing about this. That's it. What I'm going to tell you is going to surprise us very much. Get ready for another big, big surprise. If there were only two persons that were, I think are very, very knowledgeable about oil price in the future and the forecasting of oil price are these folks, the buyer and the seller who trade, that's all the do, do, trade, trade it, buy and sell, buy and sell, buy and sell oil, that's the job. Sometimes they say, I want to buy $5 million of this in the morning, I'll sell you know, this in the afternoon at this price and even two, five, 10 cent difference in the price between morning and evening can make you, we to reach a very poor very quickly. It's a very tricky business. They are very knowledgeable. The buyer and the seller have to be extremely knowledgeable what to expect for the price or oil price behavior in the future. Let me tell you how serious they are in coming up with this contract price both buyer and the seller, independent of each other. You probably have seen them sometime on TV, you know, jumping like this, you know, as trading stocks and trading, you know, they're excited and all this. Those are the guys I'm talking about. When the sun rises, it rises in Japan, Tokyo market is opened up. The buyer and the seller got earphones, notice it. As the sun is coming out in Tokyo, the market is opening up. The buyer and seller say, hey, let's see what's happening in the market there, you know? Is it going up or down, you know? What should I look at this from this, da, da, da. The sun comes to Bangkok. Again, they're connected to Bangkok. Sun comes to Delhi and then into Bombay and then into all this Tehran and da, 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 into Milan and, and London, you know? So as the sun is coming up, they're getting 
constant feedback. What, because they're going to establish the price in New York, for example. In front of them, you might notice there's a screen that I'm lecturing on now. They have a screen that has got little things like going little graphs. They're connected with the market in South America, Buenos Aires, Brazil, Rio de Janeiro, Lima, Peru, Boca de Colombia. So East and West, Tokyo to here, they're connected with the phone, then they have got this computer business going on. So they're very knowledgeable, whether it's in Australia or in Tokyo, or in Venezuela or in Colombia, or wherever in the world, they're connected because they have got to make millions, million dollar decisions quickly. And listen carefully. If there were a computer program to forecast the price of oil, would they not be using it? That program does not exist, folks. Let me give you a little more example. For that, I'll absolutely demolish whatever thoughts you had about forecasting, and then you'll understand this last example. I said these two buyer and the seller sitting in the New York Mercantile Exchange are coming away the price after 30 days. This is today. This is today. Correct. The buyer is saying to the seller, I will give you $80 when I take the oil after 30 days. Why did they say $80 to the seller? Because the buyer thinks he's smart. He got the Tokyo computers here. He said, because I think the price is going to go up in 30 days. Yes, the buyer thinks so. Let's turn around. What did the seller think after 30 days? The seller thinks with all the knowledge about everything in the world, he thinks the price is going to go below $30. One thing the price is going to go up, and the other one thing is going to go up. 180 degree difference. There's nothing more than 180 degree difference. What does that tell you? What does that tell you? Even after 30 days, these are the really, really, really experienced, knowledgeable people. They have a 180 degree difference in the price forecast. One is saying it's going up, the other one comes down. Can there be a bigger difference in, after 30 days? So if somebody comes and tells me, I've got a computer that can tell you after 20, after 20 years what the price of oil is going to be so that you can divide whether you want to go nuclear power or coal. What am I supposed to do? Try a rock to him? and push him in the town lake here. You can do whatever you want. My job is not to tell you what to do. My job is to educate you, and let you decide what you want to do. So this is called First one was net back. The second mechanism, let's explain to you.
All that I'm teaching you at this time are the different oil pricing mechanism in the global oil market. So you say, well, what is the oil pricing mechanism in the global oil market? I expect you to give these answers. I'm going to talk about four, we've talked about two. Number two is the most important one. Number one at that time was important. When it was happening, you've got the, the table. Net and oil price mechanism or methods or ways. Number three is barter trade. Barter. In the languages that you speak, I'm sure there's a word for it in their language. Simply it means what? No exchange of cash. You, 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 you stitch my shirt, I'll make your shoes. There's barter. No, uh, I've got a dozen bananas. I'll sell you the bananas and uh, you can give your oranges to me. You know, no, no cash exchange for goods and or services. Oh, so uh, no, you give me whatever, you know, some papaya. I had papaya today, so very fresh. Yeah, you give me uh, no, 10 pounds of papaya, I'll, I'll dig up uh, some flower bed for you, make some flowers um, bed where you can put some flowers. In other words, you can give your consulting services for something they can give you in return as a product. So it's exchanging of goods for services, exchanging goods for goods, okay? And who knows, nobody knows exactly, five to 10% of the world's oil is traded in under barter arrangements. And I have some interesting example. Uh, uh, let me give you a, 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 at first I thought I would show it to you, not necessarily. Then I think I have the time I can. This is number five, attachment number five. Look up number five, I'll make sure it's sent to you. Example of barter or agreements in the world. This is long, long ago, it's an old story. And long before the Ukrainian business, no. And uh, the oil export, I looking at Russia, these days, you know. Uh, Russian exporting oil, you know, it's from the bottom, look up Russia. And, uh, and they, they, so they, gave, they exchanged uh, oil to Poland. Russia has a lot of oil and gas. They, uh, Exchange, I didn't sell. Exchange for what for, for, with Poland? And crude for potatoes. So maybe Russia needed potatoes. I don't know what, maybe they make what out of I have no clue. So Poland got potatoes and uh, what Russia got, no, yeah. And they got, uh, uh, no, Poland got oil and Russia got the potatoes or vice versa, either way. In other words, there's so many examples here uh, that you can see yourself where uh, uh, you can see, you know, who got what. Uh, what, what I think I saw, what did I see here? Brazil from Iraq. You know, this was the good old days in Iraq. Iraq exchanged with Brazil to 100,000 cars. Okay. So let's talk about the last mechanism is uh, spot price. That's important. Spot price. Let's talk about spot. Let's define it. Spot price is the price on the spot. Wow, what a definition. Wow, I really gave you some heavy duty stuff today. What did Dr. Malik teach you? He taught us that spot price is the price on the spot. That's correct. 
What else can I say? That's a great definition. Let me say it again. Spot price is the price on the spot now. What? Spot price is the price on the spot now. If you're paying attention, you should realize what I did or said. In case of spot price, you have what? You have to cite location and time. Spot price is the price on the spot. Spot is here, Austin, Texas. Location. Time is, oh well, it's, it's four o'clock. Spot price at five o'clock in Austin it could be different depending on weather conditions or, or, or something happening in the south by southwest and everybody's there and oh, God knows that. Little things can change spot price. Give you another example. The spot price in New York at four o'clock today will be different from the, maybe, different, different from the spot price in New York at six o'clock today. What's the difference? Location is New York, time is different, four and six. Or the spot price in Austin, Texas at four, at, uh, at four o'clock could be different from the spot price in New York at four o'clock. Location different, remember? Four, and then Austin in New York, and, and, um, and the time is four o'clock in both cases. So the only thing to remember is spot price is very sensitive. In summer, for example, uh, it gets very hot, and uh, maybe people are, or using more conditioning and all that stuff, there's more demand for, um, for, for, for water coolers or something like that for, versus, and if it, the price, if the, it's not as hot as we thought it might be in August 24th, we hear in Austin, it could have had an impact on spot price. Um, yeah, yeah, what else can I, just, you know, just to give you an example, if it is, um, okay, if, in the Ukrainian situation, is easy to know. That's the price of oil, of oil in Ukraine today is $80 a barrel, okay? And suddenly what I hear is, in the newspaper when this time, that, that there is a truth, there is a peace between Ukraine and Russia, the price of oil went down to $60. So a geopolitical event such as that, bang, right away, affects the spot price. Even weather conditions, the political statements, yeah, little things can have an impact on spot price. That's all I want to say. Okay. So we've cited you uh, four different types of mechanism. Snatchback pricing, an interesting concept. Future market or future trading, please pay attention to that more because it's really happening now. In the bulk of the world, all is traded in futures under contract. And in a business school, they have a whole course on futures contracts, I think. And then the barter trade is where you don't exchange cash money, but you exchange services for services or services for goods. And, and then the find is spot price price on the spot now, or spot when the price. And, and so I don't have to go through all of them again. Okay. I think that's enough for today. But uh, when we meet again, again I can go on and lecturing all along forever on this subject. Of, price, we could put a stop to it somewhere. So the next lecture, whenever it will be, will be, um, should be I mean, on, on Thursday, when, not the, the next one, will be mergers and acquisition. Mergers and acquisitions. Why do companies merge? When do they get acquired? Is it a good idea or a bad idea? You know, and um, those kinds of things. Well, how do we do it? We'll talk about how do we do the mergers and acquisitions. And I'll, you know, the, the secret of all this will disappear. Believe me, it sounds very difficult to know. Everything in my course is common sense. You'll understand it. So it's going to be a fascinating subject is mergers and acquisition. Don't miss that. Okay, please don't. You're going to learn some interesting things there also. Okay. 
Take care and have a good evening. Bye-bye.